So I'm going to invite Pastor James back up. He was here with us last week, and as you guys know, he's um, he's a good friend of Greg and I's. Him, him and his wife, Erin, they have four kids. You know, we have all these things in common. But I do have one funny story to share with you. This week we decided to do our first uh, sleepover. So we had one of our girls, one of his girls came to my house, one of my girls went to his house, and, you know, we were, you know, kind of trying it out. Well, it was the middle of the night. <laughs> I'm telling it. I'm telling it. I'm just glad, I'm glad you clarified who slept over. That's all. <laughs> oh, well, that's true. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we have Scarlett, his seven-year-old, at our house. And in the middle of the night, um, I'm, like, really asleep. So I'm hearing voices, but I'm not sure if they're, like, in my dream or what's going on. And so I start hitting Greg, and I say, Greg, there's voices there's voices, and I don't know if it's in my dream. And so anyway, he gets up and goes and looks around, and he finds Scarlett and Piper playing Monopoly and chatting like they're teenagers. And he comes back, he said, oh, they were playing Monopoly. I told him to go to bed. And I turned over, and I grabbed my phone, and I looked, and you know what time it was? 3 a.m. <laughs> they're seven. I was like, oh my goodness, we are in so much trouble. But it's a joy, really, to do life with them. And, um, you know, he, he's a blessing every time he comes here. So thank you for being here, James. Oh, thank you. I don't have any stories about Ruby. She pretty much went right to bed, and we didn't have any issues. And Oh, no, actually, that, that's not the case. They're like, oh, we're scared. We don't want to go to bed. I'm like, no, go to bed. It's fine. It's all right. And they, they got to bed about 11 o'clock that night. And then I, they, uh, I woke up, and there was Ruby and my daughter, Grace, in bed there with me. And I'm like, oh, how did you guys get here? I, that's how hard I sleep. Um, I'm clueless. Um, but, you know, this morning as we're, we're going through, the, uh, I'm looking at the book of Judges, chapter 6, starting with Gideon. And right now, go ahead and turn in chapter 6. We're going to look at verse 36 here. In just Or no, verse... Yeah, verse 36, in just a moment. But I want you to go back right now in your minds, and I want you to think about one of the hardest things you have ever had to do in your life. I mean, again, this can range. Uh, everybody has different levels of tolerance, I believe, you know, and what, we're, what God puts us through. And so right now, whatever your hardest thing is, I want you to think about it right now. And uh, what is, I mean, as we look at those details, there's fear in there. There's doubt. There's struggle. I mean, sometimes just waking up in the morning and surviving is a fight and a battle emotionally, physically, spiritually. And it wears on us, and it really just begins to weigh on our hearts and our minds. And I'd like to share just for a minute here, uh, probably take two, uh, one of the hardest things that God had me go through, one of, was moving to California. All right? Um, I lived in Michigan. My whole family is there. And so when God gave us the, uh, kind of the, the movement to go, hey, go to California, I was like, okay, oh, let's go. And now, just so you know, that is abnormal for me. I mean, I, I, I go over every decision that I have to make. Should I do the blue or the green? The blue or the green? And I sit there and I think about that, which is really funny because I'm color deficient, so it doesn't matter if I take the blue or the green. <laughs> But it still is a decision that I have to think about and just weigh out. And then finally, it's just like, all right, let's just make a decision. I mean, when I go to a restaurant, I pick two things on the menu that I want because I'm indecisive about it. Like, which one do I want? And the first one out of my mouth, when the waitress asked me what I want, that's what I wanted. But it's just that making decisions are hard. So when God said move to California, I was like, okay. I had complete peace about it. I had to tell my parents, didn't care. I said to this, hey, guess what? We're pregnant with my son. And we're moving to California, all in the same breath. And that was hard, but I was like, hey, we have peace. We know this is what God's going to do. He's going to bless us. He's going to take care of us. He's going to provide for us. It's going to be amazing. And we got here, and I was working uh, with construction with my, my family, my, my wife's family. And, you know, it was going good, and all of a sudden some things just started falling apart. I remember one of the first things was like our trailblazer that was supposed to be new to us. Like the seal on the axle blew out and it cost me like $900. It's okay. God's going to take care of us. Put that on the credit card. Dump. And so it's like, all right. And then just again having more issues. And then I uh, had issues with a renter that was, oh, that was renting my house in Michigan. They weren't paying the rent. Became a problem. And so I ended up losing the house in Michigan. And I'm like, it's okay. God's going to take care of us. All right? And it's just moment after moment, 
work overtime dried up 40 hours straight. God, are you going to take care of us? For almost two years, we struggled to get through it. I was like, God, I know, I know you wanted us to come to California. I have never had a more peace and more understanding of what you wanted us to do than the moment you told us to come here. But it, it seems like for the last two years that we've been here, it's been one issue after another. And I'm waiting for you. Where are you? Are you going to show up? And in those two years, he taught me so much about his faithfulness. Now, I say this often, is I would never want to go through that again. That two years was difficult. And I said it's one of the hardest things, but I'm going to kick one of these globes down. I'm sure of it. Um, but what God taught me in those moments about who he was and how amazing he was and how he got us through that gives, us, gives me insight to know that in the future, as things I deal with, will be, you know, he's going to deliver. He's going to show up. But here's the problem is, in those moments, when it's the darkest, that's when we're afraid. That's when we feel like we need him the most. And sometimes, I don't know about you, but it feels like he's quietest at those moments. God, where are you? You called me. You told me you were going to do this. You wanted me to show up. I mean, it's one of those things where it was a struggle. I mean, I had people writing me from home, relatives saying, you are out of God's will because you're having so many problems. You are out of God's will. And when you hear that from someone you trust and love, it's like, whoa, man. Did I make a mistake? Did I do the wrong thing? And what happened is, is it's like you got to hold on tight at some time so God's promises. Even though you feel like you're going to fail, it's holding on. But where do we get that strength? I mean, there are some days, God, I know you called me. I know you want me here, but I'm losing it. I'm struggling. How do I get through this? How do I deal with this? And so I think Gideon gives us a great story that lets us know about God's faithfulness. In those moments when we are the most afraid, we can see how God dealt with Gideon. And in his character, how he took care of Israel, how he took care of Gideon, we can see that God will take care of us because God is faithful. He's always there. He's always consistent. I have a friend, um, Ben Jennings, and he he's said to me multiple times, I'm talking about maybe lamenting, maybe whining a little bit about problems. He's like, hey, you know what? God is never late. God is never early. God is always on time. And when you're in that moment, that's the last thing you want to hear. Right? And I can almost get an amen if, uh, on that. But as we look at this, I mean, the tasks that we're asked to do sometimes, even just survival can be difficult. Where do we get the strength? Now, last week we started talking about a little bit how Gideon was called by God. Uh, the Midianites had come and they had decided to take all the food and to torture and try to drive out Israel from their, their home. And so Gideon, we found him in a hole, in a wine press, thrashing his wheat, hiding, looking around for the Midianites because he knew someone was going to come take his stuff. And so through this last seven years, there's famine, there's pain, there's suffering, and the people of Israel say, God, we need you. Now that suffering and the pain and the famine and the Midianites all came because Israel decided to play the harlot. They left God. Now let me just say, sometimes problems come and it's not because we've left God. Some of it's a result of just life. Life happens, problems happen, but God can still use those. But as we look at Gideon, here he is hiding and God says, hey man of valor, I've got a plan for you. And Gideon says, right, what do you want? You want me to do that? No, there's no way. And so in that story there, as we see God using the angel of the Lord, calling Gideon to be the deliverer of Israel, we see that he showed him a sign. Gideon said, you know what, God, if you want me to, deli if you want me to deliver, wait, let me prepare something for you, and I'll bring it to you. So the angel of the Lord waited, Gideon prepared food, and they offered it up as a sacrifice right there, just by a touch. 
by the angel of the Lord. And then the angel of the Lord was gone. And then the Lord told Gideon, I want you to go and I want you to destroy the altar of Baal. Or Baal, depending on how you want to say that. But biblical names, I always say it. Say it with confidence. Nobody can doubt you because nobody else can say it. Okay? Just say it strong. Everybody's like, oh, wow, that's interesting. Oh, I like that. But as we're looking at this, he says, go destroy this altar. So you know what Gideon did? He waited till it was dark. And then he took 10 servants and they went and destroyed the altar. And they sacrificed the bull and they, uh, they left. And then the next day, what happened was all the people were pretty upset. Hey, send out Gideon. We're going to kill him because he just destroyed Baal and we're really upset. And as Joash, which is Gideon's dad, says, well, you know, if Baal is so strong and so mighty, let him come and kill my son. Which is really, you know, kind of nice of dad to stick up for him. But you see, this is the God that the people had been worshiping, a, the God that they had been worshiping for a while now, for at least seven years or more. And so as we look at this, um, Gideon's name changes to Jerubal, mean, meaning that Baal will deal with Gideon is his name. And so that's kind of like ominous. Oh, wait a minute. You know, Baal's going to kill me. But we got to think about, remember, Gideon is realizing and beginning to understand how powerful and how great God is. He's not there yet. You know, I talked about, you know, going through struggles in my, in my own life here, coming to California. And it was the idea there of holding on and just waiting and wanting God to show me, is this the right thing? Where do we get that strength? And so after uh, the, he destroys the altar, uh, the Spirit of the Lord comes on Gideon and he calls to the people and says, hey, you know what? Let's form an army. Let's get rid of the Midianites. So all these people come. About 32,000 people come. And it, as they're camped out, Gideon's getting nervous. I mean, I can't imagine having like 32,000 men waiting for my call to say, let's go fight. And then all of a sudden, like, is it really me? Should I be the one doing this? So now, this next passage, and I'm going to start reading in uh, Judges chapter 6, we normally use this as a passage to make decisions. If you're an indecisive person, such as myself, you might use a fleece to make a decision. Like, oh God, if you want me to do this, take care of this. Some of you just say, hey, let's just go do it. And if it, if it messes up, we'll change direction. So you have different personalities within that. Some people just make a decision and go, and they change things as they go. Some of us wait and, you know, wait and wait and wait a little bit more and then then we wait a little bit more and then maybe we act but we see Gideon here he's he's being indecisive he's not quite sure he's, God did you really want me to so in Ju uh, Judges 6 verse 36 then God said to Gideon if you will save Israel by my hand as you have said behold I am laying a fleece of wool on the threshing floor and if there's dew on the fleece alone and is dry on the ground then I shall know that you will save Save Israel by my hand, as you have said. So he's setting it up. So here's a fleece. If it's all wet and the ground is dry, I know, God, that you want me to do this. I will know for sure. So the next morning, here we go. And when it was so, when he rose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece, he wrung enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl with water. Verse 39. Then Gideon said to God, now here's the, here's the thing. God, he already said that. Like, you know, God, if, you, if you'll do this, then I'll do that, right? Sounds like a conversation with my kids. It's like, God, Dad, will you let me do this? I'll do that if you let me do this. But yet, here's Gideon talking to the all-powerful, all-great, amazing, loving God that delivers Israel multiple times. And he said, you know, God, could you just do one little favor for me? But then in verse 39, he says this, let not your anger burn against me. Let me speak just once more, please. Please let me have the test just once more with the fleece. Please let it be dry in the fleece only, and on the ground let there be dew. Gideon, his, his first thing is, don't be mad. Don't be mad, God. And if you look at it, the, the word says he's testing God. And God said and did so that night, and it was dry on the fleece only, and on the ground there was dew. Now, when we look at this kind of idea, this aspect of this fleece, 
Gideon's saying, give me direction, give me security, make me a promise that you're going to take care of it. So the first time he does it, oh wow, that's amazing, God did that. But then he goes and does it again. He says, don't be angry with me. Can you do it again? Now, uh, reading everything, like I've read a couple different like, commentaries and looking for information on this passage, typically what they say is that, you know, at that point, Gideon was stepping on ground that he shouldn't have been. He should have been satisfied with the first time. He should have been like, okay, God, I'm done. I'm ready to go. And yet he steps one step further. And the aspect of it, not that I want to say was it right or wrong. I want to look at the faithfulness of God in this moment. Because Gideon is doing something way out of his comfort zone. And his faith is not solid at all. And he's struggling with this decision. I mean, 32,000 against the Midianites who have... I mean, when they describe the Midianites in this passage, it's called as the number of locusts. That was not a small amount of people. It wasn't 50, it wasn't 1,000, it wasn't 10,000. They stopped counting and just said, there's a whole bunch of people. And then they came to the camels and said, hey, they've got so many camels, we can't count them. And they've got so many things. They've got so much power. They're so, they're, they're so amazing. We can't, we can't beat them. It's okay, Daniel. You don't have to be scared. I'll take, God's going to take care of it. Uh, I hate when I do that. Um, <laughs> draw attention to things. Um, but as we're going through this conversation, um, now I lost my train of thought. Um, Gideon is afraid. And I don't know about you, but I, I do not like to fail. I don't like to make mistakes. When I make a decision, I want it to be the right decision. And so he's afraid. And I don't know about you, but there are times that I feel afraid. Maybe there's times that you feel afraid. God, I just, if I just had a little bit more security, if I had just a bigger plan, if I just really saw what you were going to do, I will stand st- strong. So Gideon is feeling normal human emotions. And even though he's testing God, and it says that right away, I'm testing him, God is faithful and answers him. Doesn't rebuke him, doesn't yell at him, doesn't say, what are you, I told you already, once should be enough. You ever hear that as a parent? I told you once, once should be enough, no more. And if you look at it, even Moses, Moses went back to God and said, God, there is no way you can use me. You can't, I can't speak, I'm not eloquent, I am just a shepherd, I've tried this, been there, done that, bought the t-shirt and failed. And God was angry with him and said, if you're going to be like that, then I'm going to send your brother Aaron. That's in uh, the book of Exodus, right in the beginning there. And so God sent Moses' brother Aaron to be his mouthpiece because Moses said, there's no way. Now, for me, I look at that, that heart attitude of Moses. He was saying, no, God, there's nothing you could do with me. Gideon, I think, is willing. I think he wants to. He just doesn't have any confidence in himself. I'm the weakest. I'm the smallest. God, what can you do? And so God, in his faithfulness, answers his question. I will be with you. I will deliver you, Israel, through your hand. So Gideon goes back and he says, all right, God, here we go. Look at this. We got 32,000 people. We're ready. We're ready to fight. And God says, wait a minute. We have way too many soldiers. What? Hashtag too many soldiers said, no, said by nobody. No one's ever said that in battle. And God said, no, nope, we've got too many people. In chapter 7, verse 2, as we look at this, it's going down and uh, says this. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into your hand. Lest Israel boast over me, saying, my own hand has saved me. With the number of people right now, that Israel is going to think, wow, look what we did. Now here's the amazing thing. Here's the awesome thing is in everything that God is doing in the people of Israel, everything he's talking about, he wants one thing from Israel. He wants one thing from Gideon. He wants one thing from you and I. He wants us to give our hearts to him. That we trust him, that we depend on him, that we follow him. That's what he wanted from Israel. And they continually didn't trust God. 
God would do these amazing things. He brought them out of Egypt. He, he made them wealthy. He gave them all this promised land. He gave them cities that they didn't have to build walls. He gave them vineyards. They, they didn't have to plant. He gave them everything. Yet they continually went after other gods and disobeyed God. And so the thing that God wanted the most of was, will you trust me? Will you follow me? Will you love me alone? You see, that's what God wanted from Israel. And so he wanted them to be dependent on him. And so God says, oh, you know what? Too many people. So tell the people, if they are scared and don't want to fight, let them go home. So he says, all right, if you're scared, go home. 10,000 people are like, see you, I'm out. No, 22,000 people left at that point. He had 10,000 left. And Gideon's like, all right, 10,000, I think we could do this. Element, element of surprise, you know, maybe we can do this. And God says, you know what, Gideon? You still have too many. Gideon's like, really? And so God said, I want, I'm going to set aside a certain number of people, take them down to the brook. Now, trying to read this, the way I understand it is, if they went down and got down on their hands and knees like this and drank from the water like that, like a dog, send them home. If they knelt down and they brought the water up here to their mouth, have them stay with you. Now, uh, a historian Josephus says that they drank tumultuously, loudly. I think they were so scared that the Midianites were going to come attack them at that point. They're like drinking a really loud. I mean, they're scared. The people that were drinking like this were not like fearless. They were afraid. You probably know this story. 300 men did this, drinking from their hands, and the rest of them, what is that, 9,700 guys just laid down and sat there like a dog, and he sent them all home. He went from about 32,000 to 300. I don't know about you, but that would make me a little nervous. Let's just be honest. When God gets us in a situation and brings those circumstances, you know, my heart, I'll be honest, my heart would buckle. But again, let's look at the character of God. He delivered Israel from Egypt. He brought them to the wilderness he brought them to the wilderness for 40 years. He brought them to the land of Canaan, the promised land, and provided for them. This is the sixth chapter in the book of uh, Judges. And God has, again, six times delivered them from other people. So we're seeing God being faithful, merciful, gracious to these people. And as they're, as they're going, as we're looking at this story, God knows Gideon's heart. And he says, Gideon, you know, if you're afraid, I want you to go down on the camp of the Midianites and I have something to share with you. But you don't have to go alone. You can take your, your servant, Pura. So Pura and Gideon sneak down. I don't know how they did this. I mean, they're, they're walking through the, up to the, the camp of the, Gideon, of the Midianites and he hears a soldier talking. And another so two soldiers talking, oh, I had the strangest dream that this barley loaf, this barley cake came and just knocked down the tent here in our camp. And the other soldier in the tent said, whoa, that's the sword of Gideon. That's telling us that, you know, God, his God, the, this man of Israel, that God has delivered the Midianites, our camp, into his hand. I don't know about you, but I'd be sitting there like, if I'm Gideon, I'm like, really? God knew Gideon's heart. And he knew the struggles. He knew his fear. He knew his doubts. Yet God in his faithfulness, he, he called him. We talked about that last week, that God called Gideon to do this job, to deliver them. But then today, God encourages Gideon. He bolsters his faith. Not once, not twice, three times. And the best thing is on the third time, Gideon didn't even ask. God did it. Why? Because God wants Gideon to know that he was with him. 
for ourselves as we look at our hearts, as we look at our lives, as we look at the struggles that we go through. God wants us to know that he is with us. And you and I, if we believe in Jesus Christ, we have something that Gideon didn't have. We have the indwelling Holy Spirit within us. A sign of being one of his children is the Holy Spirit within us to guide us, to teach us, to encourage us. And so in all of this, as we look at Gideon's life, we can see the character of God being faithful, an attribute of his that is uh, eternal. God never fails. He's never late. He's never early. He's always on time. And so as we, look at this, as we look at this man, Gideon, and we look at his life story, we look at the circumstance that God put him in. He put him in a no-win situation. And then God made the odds even less so they could be shown that he, that God alone, Jehovah Jireh, was the one that delivered Israel again. It's even in the means in which God did it was ridiculous. They had a, the, Gideon and his 300 men had a, a trumpet, a torch, and a pitcher. These are not weapons of mass destruction. These are things you would find in a home, in a kitchen, things like that. So the, at the moment, they blew their trumpets and they threw down their pitchers and broke them and had their torches up high. And God caused such confusion against the Midian, Midianites that they've been kill, they be, began to kill themselves and killing each other. And all Gideon and his 300 men had to do was sit back and watch God work because God is faithful. God is powerful. God is good. And so this morning, as I, I conclude, I just want you to look at this. I don't know where you are. And I can tell you this, I cannot give you the strength. And even as I was thinking about speaking, you know, I want to do a good job, but most of all, I want you to see who God is and that he, is, he takes care of us, that he provides for his children. He is a good father. And that today, you see that picture a little bit clearer through the life of Gideon, that God, will, God provided for Gideon. He delivered the people of Israel. He will take care of you. It may not be the way that you think it was. I'm sure Gideon said, 32,000 men, we can do this. And God said, 300 is just enough. Spears and swords, right, God? No, pitchers, torches, and trumpets. I will deliver you. I will provide for you. Because I am gracious, because I am merciful, because I am loving. And all God asks in return is our heart. And you say, well, James, that's Old Testament. In Philippians chapter, the book of Philippians is one of my favorite books of the Bible. It's short, so I can read it really quickly. Um, but it starts off in the beginning right away. It says, Philippians 1, 6, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will finish it till the day of Jesus Christ. He's still working in you. He's still working through you. He is still doing things for you. And Paul begins that whole book, and he says, you know what, I want to talk to you about joy. I know your circumstances are bad. I know you're struggling. I know you're having a hard time. Look at what God is doing in my life. And this time, Paul was chained to a guard on his way to Rome and probably on his way to die. And yet he's talking to these people about joy. And he goes through these things and he talks about what salvation is, how God has provided for him, and what his purpose in life is, is to strive to be more obedient to Christ, to strive to attain the resurrection from the dead, of understanding that gift. And we get to Philippians chapter 4, 10 through 13. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have, revi you have revived your concern for me. They were worried about Paul. 
You were indeed concerned for me, but not, you had not, no opportunity. You had no opportunity to take care of me. Verse 11. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am in to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul was speaking out of personal experience of going through struggle and Jesus Christ giving him the endurance, giving him the strength, showing himself to be faithful in all circumstances. And that Paul and Gideon are testimonies in our lives today of the character of God that he is faithful, that he will take care of us and provide for us. He is a good God. He is a good Father. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and clo- uh, bow our hearts. As we think about this character of, who, of, God's, of God, his faithfulness, his, his might, and the story of Gideon and, and in Paul's life, again, I don't know where you are, and I can't say, oh, you know, it's going to be okay. What I can say is God is with you. God is faithful. I don't have the answer for your particular issue outside of the fact that God will take care of you. He is good. He is loving. God is never late. He is never early. He is always on time. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, this morning, I'm just so grateful for the story of Gideon. That through his life, through his indecisiveness, through his fears, we can see your ability, we can see your power, we can see your faithfulness. God, we praise you for this goodness. We praise you for this this character of you that just is always there. That you are there for us when we need you. You are there for us when we walk away from you. God, that we will be overwhelmed with who you are and your power, that we will be in awe of, of your strength, that, you would, that we would keep our eyes on you and not our fear, not our doubts, not our problems, not our struggles, but that we would see you and your goodness, your graciousness, your omnipotence, your omniscience. That we would see your size and your power and the problems we deal with pale in comparison to your might that you will deliver us whether it is here on this planet or is here with your presence you will deliver us so father i pray for my brothers and sisters today i pray that you would give them strength that you would give them security in your son and your holy spirit that you would empower them and uplift them and encourage them to stay strong in the midst of their problems because you are good. We pray this in your holy name. Amen.